So this is the fourth of our series of lectures on recurrent neural networks. And today we are going to tackle the issue of synchronous and asynchronous predictions with recurrent neural networks. So, so far, the story so far is that we've seen that recurrent network structures can be trained via, by minimizing the divergence between the sequence of outputs that they produce and the target output sequence. And this is done using gradient descent where the gradients are computed by backdrop. The challenge is defining this divergence. The target output may not be time aligned with the input. It may not even be synchronous with the input. So uh, how do we deal with this? To see this first, we are going to actually uh, try to understand the problem and then begin dealing with the divergences. So in this context, we saw that there can be many variants of recurrent neural networks and we've already considered a couple. The first one was this, where each, uh, where each input in a series is individually processed by a conventional MLP. So this is like what you did in homework one. So uh, this is just a regular MLP. When we use it to analyze sequences, we just apply it repeatedly to each input in the sequence and get an output for it. There are as many outputs as there are inputs. And the analysis is time synchronous, meaning every time you encounter an input, you, you immediately produce an output. Also, there's no real recurrence. The output at any time or the computations at any time have no bearing on the computations at other times. So if we apply this to series data, in this setting, since we treat, treat each input separately, the number, of the number of outputs is the same as the number of inputs, and the number of target outputs is also going to be the same as the number of actual outputs. So here you will have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the target outputs and the actual outputs. But the divergence we want to minimize is still the divergence between uh, the uh, sequence of output values and the sequence of desired output values. The only requirement being that this divergence must be differentiable with respect to the outputs at individual times. However, there's one common assumption we will make. And that is that although the real divergence is between two sequences, we will assume that the divergence can is in fact the uh, sum of the local divergences between the actual output and the target output at each time. So the sequence divergence we will assume is simply obtained as the divergence computed here plus the divergence computed here and so on over the entire uh, input. And this simplifies both the model and the max. Now, when we do this, the, uh, for backdrop, again, we need to compute the uh, derivative of the divergence, which is going to be the divergence between the two sequences with respect to each of these outputs. So the, uh, but then because of the simplifying assumption, we assume that the divergence between the sequences itself is simply a sum over all time instance of the local divergence between the output at that time and the target output at that time. So when you compute the derivative, the derivative of the sequence divergence with respect to any single output is simply going to be the derivative of the local divergence at that time with respect to the output. So the derivative of the sequence divergence with respect to yt is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence at time t with respect to yt. And once we can compute this, we can back propagate these divergences and estimate the rest of the parameters in the network. And for classification tasks, the most commonly used local divergence is the callback lambda divergence between the target output and the desired output. And when the target output is one half, then this we remember just ends up being the cross entropy. So we will have a poll just to verify that you have uh, understood this already. So let me start this poll. Mm -hmm. 
10 seconds box. Okay, let me stop it right here. Both statements are true. What we just saw is that conventional MLPs too can be used to model sequences. What we are going to do is treat each input in the sequence independently and make its prediction. But then when we use conventional MLPs to model sequences, the sequence nature of the problem is captured through the divergence, which is now the computed as the divergence between the sequence of outputs and the sequence of desired outputs. Again, when you make the simplifying assumption that we just made, then even that assumption breaks down. But yes, we can use MLPs to analyze series data. It, it just won't be a very good model. Now let's consider the second variant. So are you, this are you, I have a question here. So yeah. in the, uh, so the uh, first question, so are you referring to T, TDNN in that case? No, I'm literally referring to just this. Right? Okay. You have a sequence of inputs and each one is being analyzed. Okay, okay. Okay. So now let's consider the second variant. This is also a time synchronous network, but it's a recurrent network. Why is this time synchronous? Can anyone tell me? It's because Why for every time? input, at, you're getting an output at the same time. Exactly. For every input, you're getting, you're getting an output at the same time, but it's recurrent. And why is that? We're going to pass on the, the output from that input into the next one. Not the so you have this connection here. That's right, right? You have this connection here. So the output at any time depends on the outputs of the previous time, the computations at other times. So in a time synchronous recurrent network, the uh, network produces one output for each input. So again, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the inputs and the outputs. And this is a genuine recurrent net, which means that the output at any time is also related to what is computed at other times. We use such networks for problems like stock prediction, where you want to predict the stock at each day and, and the computations at each day sort of inform your computations the next day, or for something like uh, assigning grammar tags to words in a sequence, particularly for problems like uh, grammar tagging, part of speech tagging, the network can be bi-directional, but there's still going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input and the output. If the network is unidirectional, we will process the input left to right and produce one output for each input. If it's a bidirectional network, then in the bidirectional networks, we will have a forward layer, uh, a forward subnet processing the input left to right, a backward subnet processing it right to left and combine their outputs. But even here, eventually you're gonna have one output for each input. Now, I'm going to assume one directional networks for the rest of this lecture, but everything that I say is easily generalizable to bidirectional networks. Now here, again, we're going to train the network using variants of gradient descent and back propagation through time to compute the gradients. We're going to start with a collection of training sequence training instances, where each training instance consists of, a, of an input sequence and a desired output sequence. And because now it's time synchronous, once again, you have one actual output at every time, you're also going to have one desired output at every time. So this desired output sequence is going to be exactly long as the input sequence. But the divergence is again, the divergence between two sequences in the general case. So it's a sequence divergence. As the first step of back propagation again, we need to be able to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the network outputs at each time. Once you have these derivatives, you can perform back propagation to train the rest of the parameters. The key challenge is how we compute this divergence. And 
the manner in which we compute it depends on the definition of the divergence itself. And this can get complex. So a simplifying assumption we'll often make is that the sequence divergence is just the sum of the divergences at individual com computed locally at individual instance, just like in the non-recurrent case. So the divergence between the inputs, the output sequence and the target output sequence is decomposed as the sum over all time of the local divergences between each output and its corresponding target output. So this is a simplifying assumption, but once we make it, then the derivative of the divergence with respect to each output is simply going to be the derivative of the local divergence at that time with respect to the output. And a typical divergence that we will use in the setting for these local divergences, once again, is going to be used, is going to be the uh, callback Leibler divergence where if y target is a one hot vector, then this going this this cutback Leibler divergence simply becomes the cross entropy between the desired and actual outputs. So this again is something that you saw in the previous class. But in any case, here's another point. Okay, five seconds, guys. All right, let me stop this. So for time synchronous RNNs, again, there's one output corresponding to every input. It doesn't have to be unidirectional. It can be bidirectional, as we saw, right? And you can even combine unidirectional and bidirectional layers. So the directionality of the processing is not relevant. What is relevant is that you have one output for every input and you can uh, make the simplifying assumption that the divergence between the true and, uh, and uh, desired outputs is simply the, simply the sum of the divergences at individual times. So we've seen the first two variants of recurrent networks. Here's a third variant. This one, we went through all of the net variants in the last class. You'll remember, so now we're going through each of these carefully. Now this third variant, it produces a single output at the end of the entire input. Can anyone give me an example of uh, a situation where you will need a network of this kind? Machine transfer. I'm speaking of a single output. Sentence completion. Sentiment analysis. Document, document analysis, what do you mean Sentim document? Sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis, right? You can do this for sent, yeah. Or question answering, you know, color of sky, it's got to come up with blue. Or you can do this for speech recognition, where you get a sequence of, if you're doing isolated word recognition, then somebody gives you the entire uh, sequence of input features. And when you're done with it, at the last time, you must decide definitely what the word was. So you could get the entire sequence of vectors for a phoneme R when it's done, you say the phoneme is R, right? So in these problems, the processing is simple. For inference, uh, we feed the entire input and at the last time, when the final input has been produced, we make our prediction. But then what about at intermediate stages? What happens out here? Now, the fact is that this is a recurrent network where every column is, uh, is identical to every other column. So you actually do produce outputs at each time. You only read it at the last time. So is this point coming across? Is this clear to you guys? What's happening here? Yes. So 
The point is the structure is perfectly symmetric. The decision of reading the output is made. You read the output at only the final uh, final end there. So now when I train the network, I'm going to compute the divergence between the label, the desired output, and the actual network output at the last time, because this is where the output is being produced. And now I can just use back propagation to, to propagate those derivatives through the network and learn all of the parameters. But then when we do this, we're missing something important. We are ignoring what the network computes. Uh, we are ignoring some of what the network is actually doing. The network actually outputs values at all of these other times as well. We're just ignoring them. We're pretending that there are no outputs or that these outputs don't carry useful information. But then consider the case of speech recognition. If someone says the phoneme R, it is not just at the final input that you finally say, ah, this was the word, this was the phoneme R, right? Even at these other times, it's still the phoneme R. So you expect the network to begin recognizing the phoneme R, that the person is saying the phoneme R even before the final input. In fact, uh, you expect that this one is going to be, the output here is going to be very similar to the output here. If for instance, for, for some strange reason, the network thought the most probable phoneme over here was B and then switch to R over here, then there's probably something wrong with your model. So you expect the prediction to be consistent, right? And this we are ignoring. So to do a better job of training the network, what we can do is to not ignore these intermediate outputs and use them too. So accordingly, we're going to replicate this target label at each time. And we want the network to output the correct label at not just the final, final input, but at every time. And once I replicate the target label at each time, this has converted what was a odd looking problem to a time synchronous recurrent neural network. And we know how to deal with time synchronous RNNs. We can compute the local divergences at each time and then define the overall divergence as the sum of all of these local divergences or the weighted sum of these local divergences and then propagate the derivatives backward. Now, I'm calling it the weighted sum because the uh, weight you will give to the divergences for these repl replicated uh, instance will depend on the problem. For uh, problems like speech recognition, it's reasonable to expect that the correct label will be output at every time. So in this case, the weights are going to be one for all of these. On the other hand, if you have a problem like question answering, the situation is different. If the question is color of sky, until the word sky is entered, the answer blue doesn't make any sense. So here, the weight would be one at the final time and a weight of zero at the prior instance makes perfect sense. And so we've seen this many to one model. Any questions about this model? Anything so, any questions so far? Anyone? So I guess for the question answering case, the training will be slower because the query has to pipe back from gates through time. Yeah. So we will, we're not worrying about the training uh, uh, convergence rates and such like right now, but you're absolutely correct, right? We have a bigger problem on our hand. And the bigger problem is when we switch to this model on the right. This one is order synchronous, but time asynchronous. This is the order synchronous, time asynchronous, sequence to sequence model. You have an input sequence going in, you have an output sequence coming out, but you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input and output sequences. And uh, so the outputs themselves will come out, come out intermittently. We saw an example of such, uh, such a problem in the last class. Which one was it? Anyone remember? What was the uh, problem that had this kind of, uh, that, that had this kind of situation, speech to text, right? You have speech going in. And then if somebody says the word 
say, uh, uh, but, right? Then as you process the input, you're going to continue processing the input till you got to the end of the phoneme bar, and then you output the bar. Then you continue processing the input till you get to the end of the phoneme R, uh, and then you output the R. Uh, and then you continue on, and when you get to the end of T, you output the T. So this is order synchronous. The order of the input strictly determines the order of the output, but it's not time synchronous. The number of outputs is not the same as the number of inputs. And now, in fact, this complex looking model is actually just the concatenation of multiple of these guys, as you can see, right? I just took the same model and concatenated multiple of them, but this simple, simple concatenation causes problems. And the issue is this, during inference, the network is actually producing an output at every time. We are only reading some of them as the real outputs. But then during inference time, the network is just running, continuously producing outputs. And there's no oracle sitting there saying, read this output and read this output and read this output. We don't know when to read the outputs. And so we need some objective rationale for deciding which of these outputs to read. And there isn't an obvious rationale. Now, the fact is, the network is not just outputting a simple, simple symbol at each time. It's actually outputting a probability distribution over the entire uh, set of output symbols at each time. So at each time, you get a vector, a column of probabilities. So what the network outputs at each time is the set of probabilities for each output symbol given all the inputs at that time. So at time three, for instance, this output is going to be the probability for all of the symbols in our vocabulary, the probability that of R, of, of B, of D, of A, of E, of F, and the, all of these, given at this time, given all inputs until that time. So uh, I've, I've uh, notated it like this. When I say Y superscript D subscript three, or Y superscript D, D subscript four, this is the probability that the network assigns to the phoneme D in the fourth time instant, given all inputs until the fourth time instant. So this is what the network is actually producing, right? Now, no, because the, the uh, output is only through the recurrence. This is the recurring network, right? The connection is through the green, box, green boxes not the output doesn't go in the hidden state goes across. And so now recall that any neural network with a softmax output is actually outputting an estimate of the a posteriori probability of the classes given the input. So if there are k classes, the network will have a k component output where the ith output is p of ci given x, which is the probability a posteriori probability of the ith class given the input. Now, when we select the most probable value as our final output, we are actually performing maximum a posteriori classification. Basically, neural networks are maximum a posteriori classifiers. So we can use the same principle even in our sequence case. The network is outputting a posteriori probabilities for all of the symbols at every time. Our objective is to find the most likely symbol sequence. So what we really want to compute is the symbol sequence for which the probability of the symbol sequence given the entire input is maximized. So this is the actual problem that we want to solve. The problem is if there are say K symbols in our vocabulary and if there are T inputs, then how many possible symbol sequences do I have? Does anybody want to tell me? If I have K symbols in my vocabulary and T inputs, how many possible symbol sequences do I have? K into D. K times T? 
I can have k symbols here, I can have k symbols here, I can have k symbols here, k raised to t, right? So you're going to have to search through all of those to find the most likely simple sequence. And that's going to be very expensive. So we need a simplification. Now I can do a cheap trick. I can simply say, I'm going to select the most probable symbol at each time. At each time I go through this vector, I pick up the symbol for which, which has the highest probability. But then again, we want, you know, we want these order synchronous, but time asynchronous sequences. We want to actually output the real symbol only when the, when the, when, when the end of that particular class has arrived, right? So, because we want the outputs only at the end of each class, say the phoneme, the end of each phoneme, what we can do is merge adjacent outputs if they are identical. And then only output the actual symbol at the end of the series of repetitions. So here, so here we got G, G, F, 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 E, E, G, right? So this is going to, for this, we would output a G here, a F here, an E here, and a D, D, D here. How do you know the end of the symbol? You're, this is being repeated. So I have F, 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 so the final one has to be the end. That's the heuristic, right? You're getting to a problem. And so I can, uh, and so I can go all the way to the end. But then getting to Tushar's problem, when I get a sequence of four Fs over here, I don't know whether this is actually representing two distinct Fs or just one long F. And so, uh, I don't know whether I should be outputting G, G F, F, E, D, or just G, G, F, E, and D, right? And of course, it's also ignoring any other constraints you may have. The output may be completely meaningless in any case. I mean, I can understand feed, but what's the feed? I don't know, right? So the output can be meaningless. So we need more constraints. We need to, we need more constraints. And so a second option is to impose external constraints on what sequences are allowed. For example, you may want to only allow sequences corresponding to the pronunciations of dictionary words. Or as a second option, I can have sub symbol units. For, for instance, I can say for every phoneme, a phoneme is actually represented as, you know, if I have the phoneme P, the phoneme has a phoneme start and the phoneme end. And so this is the first half of the phoneme and then this is the second half of the phoneme. Then anytime I get a repetition of the phoneme P, I'm going to get something like this, P S, P S, P E, P E, P S, P S, P E, P E, right? That's because a phoneme must always start with this phoneme start symbol and the phoneme must always end with the phoneme end symbol. I cannot decompose this into two instances of P because both of them are the phoneme end symbol. So you can have additional uh, constraints uh, of this kind. Or there's a different way of doing it, which is to use a special separating symbol to separate repetitions. We will see that, uh, how these uh, special symbols work in the next class. So the, some terminology. We're going to refer to the process of obtaining a sequence output, output from the network, given the input as decoding. And the procedure we just saw finds, the, the procedure that we just saw finds the most likely time synchronous output sequence. Meaning it finds the most likely sequence if you assume that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input and the output, and that you can merge things later. But often, in fact, in fact, we are only looking for the most likely order synchronous output. We are not interested in time synchrony. So, for example, I may want to, I want, I may want to recognize this input as the sequence feed, right? F. I may just want to recognize this as feed. It doesn't matter to me if I recognize it as e with many, many E's and then D, or if I recognize it as F, 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 
the a, right? As far as I'm concerned, both of these represent the word feed. Whereas when I just pick the most likely sequence, it's going to pick only one of these options for any, it's not going to consider the other. So, uh, so uh, uh, the most likely time synchronous output may not be the most likely order synchronous output. For example, just consider this. I might have something where I may have say S, 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 E, 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 B, say, and this has a much higher probability than either of these guys, but every other way of arranging the, the phonemes and set against the input has very low probability. Now, if I want to consider the overall probability of SED, what I really must be doing is to sum over every way of, of stretching these three symbols across the input. And when I do that, it may just turn out that this sequence gives me a more probable overall output than this guy. So the most likely order synchronous output may not be the same as the most likely time synchronous output. So when you do something greedy of this kind and simply pick the most likely time synchronous output, this may actually be suboptimal. Then we're going to return to this topic later. So is this even making any kind of sense to kids? Yeah, it is. Um, I have a question here. So mm -hmm. when you have a lot, um, when you have a large number of phonemes, so in this case, we have only six or seven, right? So um, let's say 71 or probably 100. So in that case, won't this uh, algorithm will become a lot complex because- okay, So what we are doing, the greedy one is going to be trivial, right? You're just, going, you're just processing the input. You're going to get a hundred component vector at each time. You're just going to pick one symbol from each. It's going to be very, very cheap. It's going to be zero expense, very little expense. Yeah, but that will be suboptimal, like you like you said, yes. right? So, so we're going to spend the rest of the lecture figuring out how to deal with the optimality of it, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. So we've sort of got some basic ideas so far on how to perform order synchronous but time asynchronous inference on these models. As we just saw, we haven't fully resolved it because you know this is going to give us suboptimal outputs. But we'll revisit it in a little bit. There's a more important problem to handle first though. How do we train this order synchronous but time asynchronous model? Now, the training data that you're going to get in this kind will generally consist of input sequences and their corresponding output sequences. But the output sequences are going to be shorter than the input sequence because you get one output symbol once only every few input symbols. Now, typically what will happen is if you have training data, consider speech recognition. Someone is going to give you a speech recording and they're going to tell you that this is the recording, hello world. They will not tell you this, which portion of the recording represents the word hello and which portion represents the, word, the recording of the world, the word world. So, you will not actually have information about when you know what symbols are coming out. You will not have information about when these symbols are supposed to come out. But then consider the ideal case. Let's simplify it. Consider the ideal case where somebody actually gives you this information. So for example, if you were recognizing the word but, you got this information that the phoneme b ends at time two, a ends at time six, and t ends at time nine. In this case, we have the timing of the output symbols against the input. So the timing of, for the output symbols is what give, gives us what is called an alignment of the output sequence to the input sequence. It tells us which portion of the input sequence aligns against which symbol. So for a given output sequence, you can have many, many alignments. For example, here if I have this 10 vector input and the output sequence is but, then there are different ways of aligning but to this input sequence. You could have B uh, spanning the first four inputs, uh, the next four and T the last two, or B spanning the first two, uh, the you know, central five and T the last three. You can have an exponential number of such alignments 
So if I simply give you the output sequence and say, you know, the output sequence was but, you don't know which of these alignments is, uh, is the one that actually represents, that, that is actually valid for this particular recording. So just having this output symbol sequence doesn't tell you this alignment. The alignment is additional information that you're missing. But then let's continue considering the case where the training data includes not just the output se sequence, but also its alignment. So if you are given the output alignment, it tells you which portions of the input correspond to each symbol, then things are simple. Now you can just define the divergence as the sum of the divergences at the specific input times where you have the label. So here it would be the divergence between B and Y2 at, uh, at time two, plus the divergence between I and Y6 at time six, plus the divergence between T and Y9 at time nine. And that is the divergence whose derivatives would pop up. But if you want to be more, if make more efficient use of your input, you can repeat the symbols into the unlabeled portions, into the unlabeled time steps that also belong to the same phony, like we did earlier. So you know this is B, but these two are also part of the build up to B. So you can replicate B over here and here. This is R. So you can replicate R over here and here and here. This is T. You can replicate T over here and here. Now we have a time aligned label sequence. If I have a time aligned label sequence, we are back to familiar ground. I can define the divergence as the sum of all of the local divergences. And especially if you're, you know, this is very important, right? This, this equation is going to keep coming back again and again. If I have the time aligned sequence of symbols, then the divergence is the sum over all time of the callback liable divergence between the output and the target label at each time. And when the target label is represented using a one hot representation, this callback liable divergence is simply going to be the negative of the log of the probability assigned by the network to the target label. And this is what you'll sum over all time. So do you guys remember that this is what it is? The callback liable divergence between a one hot target label and the output of the network is simply the negative of the log probability assigned to the class. Do you remember this? Guys, yes, no? Right. I need a few more yeses, just not one person. Or it should it be a poll. All right, at least two. And so that's what you have at each time. And the overall divergence is the sum of that across all time, right? And now I can compute the derivatives, back propagate, problem solved. The real issue is the timing information is not provided. And now, because in your standard setup, somebody is just going to tell you, here is my recording, the word was but. Lord. So what is missing is information about where ber, ah, enter, end. So you might be given information that this input has this particular label sequence, but not where the individual sounds ended. And this is in fact very natural in this kind of setting. In speech, for example, uh, people just give you recordings and the word sequence in them, but nobody's going to sit down and painstakingly mark the end, the end of each word. And the fact of the matter is it's very often even impossible to find the precise end of each sound and speech. The phonemes sort of meld into each other. So in this setting, how do we define the divergence between the network outputs and the true labels? And so, and so how do we define this divergence and how do we compute its gradients from back propagation? This is the problem. So here's the setting. We know how to train the network when the alignment between the output and the input is provided. But the problem is no alignment has been provided. 
So how can you train a network? There are two possible solutions. One, somebody gave us this input but forgot to give us the alignment. So let me guess the alignment. And once I guess the alignment, I'm in familiar ground, I can train my network. Alternately, instead of trying to guess the alignment, I can consider every possible way of aligning the aligning the sequence to the input. So one, I could consider every possible alignment all at once. So how do we go about both these solutions? So we're going to consider the first solution today. Here, for the first approach, we're going to try to guess the alignment between the target sequence and the input. And then we will use the guessed alignment to train the model. But then, what is the problem with trying to guess the alignment? How would we actually guess the alignment? Guessing the alignment is hard. You're not going to sit there and you know, listen to it. You're going to do it algorithmically. And so guessing the alignment, mean, alignment means you're actually going to use the model itself to guess the alignment, the neural network itself. And when you haven't yet trained your model, the neural network is not very good. So the alignment and guesses is going to be wrong. And so we're going to have to refine the alignment. So here is the procedure we will follow. We will guess an initial alignment and then iteratively refine it as the model improves. So assign an initial alignment somehow, maybe uniform uh, or random or based on some other heuristic. Then train the network using, the, using that alignment and then once you train the network, you have a network that has learned something about speech. You use this learned network to re-estimate the alignment. And then you use the re-estimated alignment to go back and train the network again. And you can keep repeating the process until the learning converges. Now here, we know how to assign an alignment, no big deal, right? And given an alignment, we know how to train the network. This is just backdrop because once you're given the alignment, this becomes a time synchronous representation, uh, time synchronous model. So the real challenge is really is estimating the alignment for each training instance. So let's see how to do this. But first, we need a way to represent the alignment in a useful way. We can represent the alignment. And the way we are going to use the rep to represent the alignment is by repeating symbols. Instead of saying the phoneme B occurs at three, R occurs, you know, B ends at three, R ends at seven, and T ends at nine. I'm going to say the uh, sequence is B, 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 R, 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 ta, ta, right? So I will repeat this symbol through the stretch that that ends in that symbol. I'm going to repeat the R uh, through the stretch that ends in, in, in R. Uh. I'm going to repeat the term through the stretch that ends in term. So now, if I'm all only given ber uh, and ter, this is one alignment of to my input, but then there are many ways of aligning it. I could also align it like so, or like so. So there are many, many ways of aligning it. Now observe that the initial original sequence that we were given was not time synchronous. It was order synchronous, but not time synchronous. But when you express the alignment in this way, the output, the aligned version of this order synchronous sequence is now time aligned. You have one symbol per input. And so uh, the alignment expressed by repeating the symbol is time synchronous. And so the problem of estimating an alignment is this. We are given an unaligned k-length symbol sequence as zero to sk minus one. For instance, you know, if the word is beefy, it's ber, e, for e, these are the four phonemes. Then you're given an input of some length where the length of the input is definite, is, is not lesser than the length of the symbol sequence itself. So the length, if the length of the input is n, and the length of the symbol sequence is k, n is greater than or equal to k. 
And let's say you have a currently trained network. So we're dealing with the problem of aligning the sequence to this input using a trained network. So our job is to find an n length expansion of the sequence obtained by repeating each symbol over here as the, the correct number of times such that the sequence obtained after repetition is the same length as the input. So our job is to find this repetition. Now, if you do that, if you can successfully find it, you found an alignment of the sequence to the input. Now, before I continue, let me just introduce a little notation. I have a large S. So this large S is represents a unique symbol in the, in the order aligned, but non-time aligned sequence, the original sequence. I'm also using a small S. The small S represents uh, the, the small s represents the symbol at any given time. So when I say s0, s0 is the symbol at time 0. And s0 is going to be one of these guys, right? So again, the uppercase s's represent the unaligned sequence. The lowercase s's, like this one here, represents their alignment. And so for this instance, beefy, if, if my input were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 long, and if I align beefy to the input and I got this alignment, then I'm going to have over here S0, SB, S1, SE, S2, SF, and S3 is again E. But then using the smaller symbols, I'm going to have, if the, for this alignment, I have S0, this is, these are the lowercase s's, S0 is B, S1 is B, S2 is B, S3 is B. These are my s's, they look, these horrible squiggles are s's. S4 is B, S5, S, F, and so on. So, is this notation making sense to you guys? In, in spite of my horrible scribbles. Okay. Now, there are many, many ways of aligning this unaligned sequence. Actually, yes. Together. Ten seconds, guys. Uh, the poll disappeared. That's okay. I had to end. We had to end it at some point, right? But okay. Uh, I'm going to kill this poll. We will repeat the poll at the end of the slot. Give me a minute. Now. When we showed you this poll, I was sort of uh, introducing some notation, some 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 uh, uh, terminology over here, and I wasn't sure of how intuitive it is. So this is that they think of this as uh, testing whether you and I are speaking going to be speaking the same language. But here it is. When I think of aligning an unaligned sequence to an input. There are many ways of aligning an unaligned sequence to an input. So to estimate the alignment, we want to find the most probable alignment. Formally, 
for an input of length n, we want to find the most probable n length simple sequence given the unaligned k length sequence and the input. So this unaligned sequence and this aligned sequence are related. How are they related? The unaligned sequence is just a compression of the alignment. So for example, if I have an input of length 10, if I say the phi is the unaligned sequence, right? Then this guy is an alignment of the sequence, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So this guy is an alignment of the sequence, right? So you can see that the alignment can be obtained by repeating these symbols the appropriate number of times. But then how can I go from the, un, from the aligned sequence back to the un unaligned sequence? The way I can go from the uh, aligned sequence back to the original sequence is by squelching repetitions, right? I can get rid of repetitions. And if I get rid of repetitions, I'm going to get back the original sequence. But then, the, so this, removing repetitions to reduce the length of the sequ aligned sequence is what I will call compressing it. But there's an issue over here that if I have something like this, I'm trying to write in my handwriting, so if I have something like this, then there are many ways of compressing the sequence, right? Can somebody give me a couple of different ways of compressing the sequence? What compressions could I have? Down sample it? Not down sample, right? So this, the feed, this is a compression, correct? I got this by removing repetitions. But can you give me something else? How about this? This too is a compressed version of this curve, right? You, we didn't say you have to remove every repetition. We, we just said we remove repetitions. Or I could have something like this. So there are many, many ways of compressing an alignment to get a compressed sequence. And the target sequence that we, are, we have over here is going to be just one of these compressions. So basically when I say, when uh, I ask you, when I, when I state this problem, this equation says, find me the most probable alignment that has a compression, which is the same as my target sequence. It doesn't mean every compression of this guy is beefy. It means that find me the sequence that has a compression, which is the same as my target sequence. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, guys? Yes, yes, Igli? Um, Professor, I had a question. Um, wouldn't it be easier to have a new phoneme for any collection of the same phoneme that is repeated? Like, wouldn't that make encoding easier than having multiple ways to compress a sequence? So again, the problem is which of these are you going to use? Yes. So, so the problem is this. The label gives you this. If you want to say B, B1, you know, B2 is two repetitions, B3 is three repetitions and so on, you expect your labels to have these symbols, right? Yes. Because when somebody, you won't get it. You didn't change the problem, right? So, uh, right, going back you, to, yeah. Instead of having double E's, wouldn't it be better to have that encoded as a whole nother uh, phoneme so that we don't have to choose whether we keep two or we keep one, but we know 
that it's not that thing to begin with. Like we would increase the number of phonemes that we have. That would be kind of bad, but it makes compression be like unique. It's not, it doesn't solve the compression problem, right? Because if I have E and E2, now I have two symbols in my vocabulary and I'm going to be having, you know, in, you know, your label will say this is E2. So you're going to begin looking at E2, sequences, sequences of E2, that's all it does, right? Okay. Because you don't get precise information when you get the labels. You're going to say this is a long E. So a long E is a different than a short E, but that's about it. It's not going to say it's three, 300 milliseconds long, right? It doesn't really solve the problem. And so going back to this poll that we had, let me repeat the poll. Uh, so what we have is an order synchronous simple sequence that is shorter than the input. Actually, why don't I uh, relaunch this poll? And perhaps you can answer me now. You have 60 seconds. Five seconds, guys. The answers must be obvious, right? The first four are all correct, and the last one is wrong. All the synchronous symbol sequences that are shorter than the input are compressed symbol sequences. A symbol sequence that is time synchronous with an input can be compressed to a shorter order synchronous input by eliminating repetitions. The alignment of an order synchronous symbol sequence uh, to an input is a time synchronous, synchronous symbol sequence. And an order synchronous symbol sequence that is shorter than the input can be aligned to the input by repeating symbols until the expanded sequence is exactly as long as the input. This is basically what we have been seeing so far, right? So hopefully uh, this sort of brings the idea across. I'm going to just assume that you understood it. Now, again, recall that what the network actually outputs is the full set of probabilities for every symbol at every time. So at each time, it's going to assign compute the probabilities for all the symbols in your set. So the output of the network is actually a table of probabilities. It's a vector of probabilities at each time. If I just write them out like so, it's a table, right? One column per time and one row per symbol in your vocabulary. So we could just, my problem is given this one, I need to find the alignment of an input sequence to the input, whereas of a label sequence to the input. Now, the simple thing is I could just find the most likely sequence of symbols by picking the most probable symbol at each time. But then this sequence may not compress to the sequence that we want. For example, here, the sequence we want is say, B phi, right? While the most probable same symbol sequence at each time, which is shown in red, is something completely different. This one is not going to compress to B phi. There's no way of compressing this sequence to B phi. So given this, what can I do? How can I improve on this? Anybody want to suggest? How do I improve on this? <laughs> 
Okay, since there are no answers, I can try simply blocking out all the rows corresponding to symbols that are not in our target sequence. So block out all rows other than B, E, and F in our example. Practically, the way you would do it is you'd run the net and get the full table of probabilities and then copy the rows corresponding to B, E, and F over to this new reduced table. And then decode only on this reduced table. This way we are assured that we won't get any spurious symbols. If I decode on just this guy, is this enough to ensure that the decoded output is an alignment of my target sequence B3? No, right? Because I can get something like this, this still doesn't ensure that the output we get is a valid alignment. So uh, for example here, the decoder obtained by selecting the most likely, uh, uh, symbol, most probable symbol at each time is going to be B, B, E, E, B, B, F, F, I. And this is going to compress at best to B, F. So this is incorrect, right? So let's try something different. Let's copy the rows from the output probability table of the network and arrange them top to bottom in the same order as the symbol sequence that we are trying to align. So for B fee, we would copy over this B row of the table and make this our first row here. Then we'd copy the E row of this table, make this the second row. We'd copy the fur row of this table and make this our third row copy the E row of the table, which is here again, and make this our fourth row. So when we do this, uh, you'll copy the rows for each symbol in our unaligned sequence and order. So if a symbol occurs multiple times in the unaligned sequence, we're going to copy the row for that symbol multiple times, once for each time that it occurs in this sequence. And so here's a pseudocode for, so basically if a symbol occurs multiple times, we repeat the row in the appropriate location. Here, for instance, uh, E occurs twice in the second and fourth position. So we have a row E copied over twice. Now, uh, here is some pseudocode for constructing the table. The uh, small s here is the table. And we're going through each of the n symbols in our unaligned sequence and copying the corresponding row uh, into the ith row. So for, for, the, for the ith symbol in our unaligned sequence, we are finding the corresponding symbol SI and copying that row over into the table. So here, for example, uh, for the first symbol that would, is B. So SI would be B, S1 is B. You copy the B row over as the first row of this table. The second symbol is E. So you copy the E row as the second row of this table and so on. And now we will now decode from this table, but with the constraint that the first symbol in the decode must be the top left block and the last symbol must be the bottom right. Furthermore, the rest of the symbols must follow a sequence that monotonically travels from the top left to the bottom right. So the symbol chosen at any time can only be in the same row as the previous symbol, or it can be in the next row as the previous symbol. It cannot be in a previous row. It cannot jump to rows. So when we, when we choose a path through this table, the symbol chosen at any time can either be in the same row as the previous symbol or it can be in the next row as the previous symbol. That way you're guaranteed that when you compress the alignment, you'll always get the target symbols in the right order. And so here any sequence that, that you get that follows these rules will compress to beefy. So to constrain the graph of decode, we'll, we'll construct a graph where we will, we will treat each cell in this table as a node. From each cell, we have two edges, one going immediately right, 
and one going down one row and one step to the right. Each node over here has a score. That's the probability for that cell. Remember, this table was constructed by extracting rows from the output of the network, right? So each row over here is basically a row of probabilities. This row is the probability for the symbol B at time zero. This is the probability of B for B at time one and so on. Every cell here is a probability for a symbol at some time. And so uh, when, uh, when we see this table over here, every node has a score that's a probability for this cell. And these symbols represent these probabilities. So Y B zero, for instance, is the probability assigned by the net to the symbol B at time zero. Every edge over here in the graph has a uh, score that is one. So once I draw this graph in this manner, uh, I'm going to have a directed graph. This top left node is going to be the source node for the graph. And the bottom right node is going to be the sync node for the graph. And now if I draw any path through this graph from the source to the sink, that path is going to be a valid alignment of this target sequence. So is this making sense to everyone? Okay. The problem simply becomes finding that, that of finding the uh, best path or the most probable path to this graph. Now, the score of any path through this graph is simply the product of the probabilities of all the nodes in the path. So for example, for this partial path, path shown, the score is yb0 times yb1 times ye2 times ye3 times yf4. And that's because the edge probabilities are all one. So every time we extend the path by one node, we just multiply that node score to the current path score to get the score for the extended, extended path. Now, an end-to-end -end path from top to bottom is going to be a complete alignment and it will have a score, a probability. Now, there are an exponential number of such paths through this graph and there are key symbols in the unaligned sequence and if there are t inputs, then you have you know, roughly of the order of k raised to t paths. So finding the, uh, finding the uh, most probable alignment is the probable problem of finding the most probable of these paths. Yes, the shortest path. And so our problem is that of finding the best align of finding the best alignment reduces to that of finding the most probable path from source to sync through this graph. And you can do it using any dynamic programming for algorithm, for example, the Viterbi algorithm. So I'll briefly outline the Viterbi algorithm. Most of you are familiar with it, I'm sure. The basic idea behind the Viterbi algorithm is this, the best, and by, by, by best, I mean the most probable path from the source to any node must come from, come, must come through one of the nodes tenants. So here, for example, the best path to the red node must come either through this blue node or this green node. Moreover, the best path to this node must in fact be an extension of the best path to this node or the best path to this node. Because if you chose any other path, those paths are going to have a lower score. So to decide the best path to this red node, all we have to do is to go through all of its parents, find out which one has the highest best path score and extend the path from that parent to this node. And so this gives us the Viterbi algorithm. We go from left to right and uh, at each time we dynamically track the best path from the source node to every node in the column at that time. So we go through the time, go through time, and at each time you find the best path from the source node to that path. And as you go forward, you keep extending those paths. In the process, we keep track of two things. We keep track of the best parent 
for each node and the best path score to the node. Then once we have done perf performing this computation for all the nodes in the graph, we have enough information to find the best path from source to sync. So to ex actually explain the algorithm, I'm going to introduce some notation. Uh, R over here is the row index. SR is the rth symbol. So for R0, SR is, you know, for R0, R0 represents the zeroth row if I'm using a zero based indexing. S0 is the symbol corresponding to the zeroth row, which is B. Similarly, uh, for S1 and S3, the symbol is E. This is for R1 and R, R equals 1 and R equals 3. S2 is F. And now, uh, these, these uh, simple probabilities again is simply, for instance, Y superscript E subscript 3 is the probability of the symbol E at time 3, which has been computed by the network. So here is the algorithm. We first compose this graph. Then we begin at the first column of the graph, which corresponds to time 0. The first column nodes have no parents. So their parent, the first column nodes, parents, is, parents are all in all for all k nodes in the first column. The first node here gets the probability for its corresponding symbol. So it's y, y d zero. Since the path over here so far, if I'm just looking for the best path from the source to this node, it's just the node itself. And so y b zero is also the best path probability to this node. Now, these nodes are not valid starting nodes for any path. So we're gonna give all of these nodes a score for zero, a score of zero. Then, uh, so the best parent is going to be null for all of these guys. The best path score for this one is going to be just by the zero. The best path score for the rest of these guys is going to be zero. Then I step through time at each, I step through time at each time, I, st I step through all the nodes at that time. And at each node, I'm going to identify the best parent with the highest score. So I'm going to, for each node, I'm going to find that amongst all of the parents, which parent has the highest best path score. That's my best parent. I store that in DP. And then the best path score to the node itself is going to be the best path score of the parent times the node score. So basically for each node, I find which of the parents has the highest score. I'm going to call that, I'm going to have a pointer pointing back to that parent, informing me that the best path to this node is an extension of the path to the best parent. And the best path score to the node is simply going to be the best path score to the parent times the node score. So let's animate this. At time one, the first row of nodes have only one parent. So the best parent is simply going to be, I just, I, I don't need, I only need to store because you're always going forward uh, one uh, time instead at a time. I only need to store the row index of the parent. So the best parent at time zero is simply zero. The best path score for this node is simply going to be the best path score for this node times the symbol probability for this guy itself. So in general, the best path score at, uh, at uh, uh, for the zeroth uh, row at any time is simply going to be for the node in the zeroth row at any time. The best parent for a, for a node in the zeroth row is simply going to be uh, the uh, zeroth row node at the previous time. And the best path score is simply going to be the best path score to that node multiplied by the current node score. That's for the first row. For the remaining nodes, each node is going to have two parents. So uh, the two parents are either the previous node in the same row or the node in the previous time in the earlier row. So for any row L, the parents are either L at the previous time or L minus one. So you're going to pick whichever, whichever of the two has the 
higher best path score. And then the best path score to the node itself is simply obtained by multiplying the best path score to the best parent by the node score. So you, you would compute this, you would perform this computation to find both the best parent and the best path scores for all of these nodes. And you'll naturally find that for these two guys, because all of the parents have zero, zero score, the best path score to this, these nodes is also zero. Then having computed the best paths to all of these nodes and the best path scores, you'd go to the next time, repeat the same logic. The first row nodes only have one parent, but the subsequent nodes have multiple parents. For each node, you're going to pick the best parent, have a pointer back to the best parent, and then extend the best path score to the best parent with the probability for the node itself to give you the best path score to the node. You can keep doing this going forward one step at a time, and each time you pick the best parent and retain a pointer to it, and then extend the best path score to the current node. So it does guarantee it goes from top to top left, top right, top left to bottom right, because the parent for each node is either look at the parents. It's it's only looking for at any row L. It's either considering L minus one or L. So it's only considering the same row or the previous row. So that is encoded in the graph, right? And then finally, when you've done this, you're going to have the best path score for all the nodes in the graph. Now we know that the final node in the path must be this bottom right node. So we can start from here and you can find out its parent. You can find the parent of that parent and trace the sequence of parents back. And that sequence of parents is going to give you the best path through the entire graph. And so just by following the parents from the sink to the source, we can find the best overall path from the source to the sink. And this is going to give us our most probable alignment of the uh, unaligned sequence to the input computed using the current model. So uh, I have the pseudocode for that over here. The pseudocode is basically following exactly the logic that we discussed. Uh, we first extract the reduced table of scores. Then we use the iterative algorithm to go through time, finding the best path score and the best parent for each node. And then finally, finally starting from the end, we can track the best parent back to find the best alignment. And as a matter of fact, it's not necessary to explicitly cons construct this reduced table. Uh, we can just use the fact that, you know, instead of constructing this S table over here and using S T comma I over here, I can directly just use whatever value I would assign to S T R in this upper portion of the table and have a reduced, uh, a simpler code of this, which uh, has indirect indexing. So please go through the code. You need to understand it for the quiz in the homework. So there is one more poll, one final poll. Uh, can we uh, do the next poll? So to answer the question, uh, to answer Sean's question, because you are you are only tracking the best path backwards from the bottom right node, you're guaranteed to get an alignment. And of course, the top row nodes, uh, the bottom row nodes have an out degree of one. The remaining nodes here have an out degree of two. So let me stop the poll. The uh, and I'm going to need two more minutes, right? 
but the Viterbi decoding finds the most probable alignment of the compressed order synchronous sequence to an input. It's run on a table of probabilities constructed for the compressed sequence with one row for each symbol in the sequence derived from the probability table generated by the output of the recurrent network. What it doesn't do is compute, is selling the most probable sub symbol from each column of the table. You're actually finding the best path through the graph and for the, and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, symbol that you may end up with when you find the best path through the graph. For instance, this one may not locally be the most probable symbol in this column. It's just that uh, as a, it's just that because of the constraints that we had, this ends up being the chosen symbol in the best path itself. So while it may not be the most probable sequence over here, symbol over here, the, the uh, symbols that follow these guys legally might have such low probability that they don't end up in the alignment. So going on. So now we have found an alignment of the input of, of the sequence to the input. We can use this most likely alignment as our time sync synchronous target for training. And since we have time synchronous labels, the divergence now is simply the sum of the local divergences at each time between the uh, alignment output and the network output at each time. Again, note this is important. This is going to pop up repeatedly. So if you use one hot representations, this is just the, the negative of the sum of the log probabilities assigned by the network to the symbols in the alignment sequence, minus sum over t, the log of the probability assigned to the aligned symbol at time t by the network. And since at each time t, this only depends on the probability of the aligned symbol at the time. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to by t, the output at each time, the output probability vector at each time is simply going to be this vector here, which is zeros at all components and minus one over the probability assigned to the symbol on the best path sequence, the, the aligned symbol at that time. And the alignment itself is estimated. So we'll keep seeing this again and again. Uh, so once we have this alignment, the alignment of course depends on the probabilities, which in turn depend on the model. So we have this iterative algorithm. You initialize the alignment, then using, using the initial alignments, you train a model, perform Viterbi decoding and find the best alignments for the training data, update the model using the alignment and iterate until the alignments converge. Now the decode and train steps may be uh, combined into a single decode, find alignment and compute derivative steps for SGD and many batch updates. But the general principle is this. So while training, we have a couple of options. In each epoch, we could either go through the entire training data and find all their alignments and then update the model using SGD for the epoch or during SGD for each training instance, find the alignment as part of the forward pass and use it in the backward pass. So clearly this will be much more efficient. Now, this, this procedure will work and it's complete. The uh, problem here is that it's prone to local minima. It is heavily dependent on your initial models and if they are bad, your alignments will be bad and you'll never recover. So an alternate solution is don't commit to an alignment during, during any iteration. Instead, you consider every possible alignment of the unaligned sequence to the input. So this is what is called the connectionist temporal classification methods. And uh, we're going to deal with this and some extensions, including the introduction of a blank symbol and more optimal decoding in the next class. So uh, I'll stop right here and start the recording.
And I'll take any questions.